are nearing the end of class, and as a matter of fact, this is the second to last review. So if you're feeling a little sentimental, need to get a little misty or emotional, I understand. Okay, it's passed. Now, this is an unusual chapter. It is more economics and sociology and not a whole lot of history. But the older I get, the more I realize all of the social sciences are interconnected. And point of note, all the subjects you learn about in school are interconnected. I think you're going to figure that out when you are old. I don't know why school separates them like they do, but they do. So anyway, let's get into the economics and sociology of it all. The age of fossil fuels. This is a term that I think everybody understood. And you can see the use of fossil fuels just going higher and higher and higher. And people are well aware of the pollution it causes. However, how effective and efficient it is in powering our industries. So that one didn't require a whole lot of explanation. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. And the communication revolution this is the other term that people understood very well. And as a matter of fact, we think of telegraph, the first instant communication and telegraph road in Detroit. That's because the telegraph telegraph lines were there and then we had those phones where you had to crank a handle and get the operator and then we had rotary dial and push button and those big brick phones and then the flip phones that your grandma still might have and then obviously the tools we use today so in less than 200 years we went from no instant communication to what we have today you know being in real time FaceTime international it's gone very quickly. So anyway, that's the communication revolution. Now to the economics. Now this idea of economic globalization is a term that shows that these global economic entities truly are global. And this picture here having McDonald's here in Russia. And I have traveled to a lot of places in the world and there are certain corporations that I have seen everywhere I've traveled. I could get a Coca-Cola everywhere I've traveled. So this uh, multinational corporate world we live in, it's fairly new and it's very powerful. The Asian tigers. Now the Asian tigers are these rising powers that are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So it's Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Their economic rates are going through the roof and they certainly went through the roof from the 60s to the 90s. And they're going to continue to likely um, become stronger. And this term hegemony, dominance, power, economic hegemony is shifting to Asia in recent years. And most people got that. As a matter of fact, if you look at the stuff that you are wearing and your binders and your pens, most likely it was made by one of these Asian tigers. Okay, it's not hard to find their uh, their commodities just in everyday life. Okay, now the Bretton Woods system, this might be the most AP of AP terms. The Bretton Woods system was a result of uh, World War II and the attempt to keep stability economically. And it was an agreement between the US, Australia, Western European countries, Canada and Japan, which tried to keep the currency steady. They used gold to try to keep economic stability. So you can see this visual here, the British pound, the German mark, the French franc. I know these two use the euro, euro now, but back in the day, it was designed for economic stability. But think of the Cold War implications. Notice that these nations were allies and part of that capitalist democratic side of the world. Now, transnational corporations, I mentioned it a little bit ago. These are global, powerful, multi-gazillion dollar companies. And you can see some of these Pepsi Cola, Citibank, Samsung, um, Marlboro cigarettes. You know, I already mentioned Coca-Cola. And the world is seeing um, an increase in these corporations and the power of these corporations. Big deal money being um Go, going on at this point. Now, the World Trade Organization, this is an international organization to keep economic stability. And it deals with rules of trade to try to have the most favorable outcomes for both sides. And in a sense, it's networking because if you join the World Trade Organization, you have people that you can buy and sell with. So it's powerful and it produces a whole lot of money. So I think you're seeing the 
the vibe or the flavor or the theme of this chapter, it's big time money, big time corporations. And this philosophy emerged, consumerism. It's the belief that if I purchase things, it is good for society. It is good to buy as many things as I can. Unfortunately, this philosophy has resulted in a lot of people being in huge credit card debt, having all sorts of financial problems because it's put in people's heads, buy, buy, buy. I've even heard people saying, I need to have some retail therapy, which, which means I'm going to go spend my money on a bunch of stuff. Um, so this philosophy coincided with it. But again, the name of the game for these corporations is you need people to buy the commodities. So this philosophy coincided with that. Now, export processing zones, another real AP term. Um, where I see this a lot is Starbucks, to give you a tangible example. And my wife really likes Starbucks. We go in there, I see coffees from developing parts of the world. And Starbucks says, hey, we're doing business with this, uh, used to be called third world countries, now it's called a developing world. And it's an attempt to get these third world countries into the economic mix to encourage corporations to use commodities from these areas. And they're called EPZs or export processing zones. Service sector. Now, if you, I'm going to use an example, probably shouldn't use this example, cigarettes. Okay. Now, if you think about a cigarette, somebody has to grow the tobacco. That's the raw material side of it. They take the raw tobacco and they bring it to a factory and they turn them into cigarettes. Now, at this point, no money is changing hands. Somebody has to get those cigarettes and sell them to the gas station or the tobacco store where people will buy it. That's the service sector. That's the third sector. And throughout time, the service industry is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. The majority of you, the jobs that you will have as adults, I'm going to guess a lot of them are in the service sector. I'm a school teacher. I don't make any raw materials. I don't make any physical commodity. I provide a service. I teach a graduation requirement um, to 16 year olds. That's a service. So I'm in this sector and it's becoming more and more important in the economy and more common in the economy. Informal economy is not a good thing. Okay. So a formal economy is an industry that is re uh, regulated by the government. They can get all the data for it, but there's a lot of kind of side hustles. That's the slang of the time. I got a side hustle. So if you cannot make money through legitimate means, you have to find a plan B. And they call this an informal economy. And the bigger the number of an informal economy, it's a sign that the economy isn't very good. Now, the higher your formal economy, the better economically you're looking at. Okay. Now, one child family, now China and India and a lot of in the whole world, you know, I think about this. When I was born in 1974, there were 4 billion. As I speak to you, there's 8 billion. So in China, they attempted to have a one child policy to alleviate overpopulation. And they've gone away from it. It did not get adopted in the rural regions. And it had some implications that were very difficult because in China, male children are oftentimes favored over female children, and it caused a disproportionate of uh, women to abort female uh, uh, fetuses or future babies. I don't want to get too political here. So this question of how do we handle overpopulation, probably the one-child family is not it, but who knows what the future holds? Other parts of the world might have to do this out of necessity. Now, I hate to say this because I don't see a whole lot of upside in communism. Communism is a horror show, in my opinion. However, this notion that everybody's on the same page, everybody's in the same situation and all the resources get uh, reallocated would give credence that women are equal. So what happened in Russia, this women's department emerged to try to get women to take a more active role in society. So uh, prior to the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, women were not treated well. So we see you know, um, uh, an improved situation for Russian women during this time. Second wave feminism. Now we learned about first wave feminism, which was primarily suffrage, voting, Seneca Falls. Second wave feminism was more about equal pay for, e uh, for equal work and having access to education and birth control decisions. And in America, that culminated in 1973 with Roe versus Wade, where this nation 
legalized uh, a woman's right to have an abortion. In recent years, that's kind of going the other direction, but this is the second wave, okay? So the first wave, suffrage, second wave, equal pay for equal work, reproductive rights, access to education. And feminism in the global south, very AP term here. Now, women in Asia, Africa, and Latin America had a double whammy. They had to overcome the oppression of uh, imperialism and colonialism and oftentimes facing cultures that tried to diminish them as second-class citizens. So we see women in the global south really pushing hard for improvements in their life. So I have a lot of respect for these women because it's a real uphill battle. So can't say this chapter had a whole lot of history, but it had a whole lot of economics, a whole lot of sociology, and I'm going to end like I began. These social sciences are all interconnected. It's not they're separated in school, but in practice and in real life, they are all tied together. So thank you for watching.